I got X amount of dollars for a celebrity boxing match. Who you want? Who you want your opponent to be? First one is Shaq, <laughs> Barkley. <laughs> yeah, them two. Oh, you want Shaq? You want you want a you want a celebrity boxing match with Shaq? Yeah, I'll take I know you about 75 pounds heavy, but I'll take him. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle paid the price. Want a slice, got to roll the dice, that's why. All my life, I've been grinding all my life. Yeah. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle paid the price. Want a slice, got to roll the dice, that's why. All my life, I've been grinding all my life. Hello, welcome to another edition of Club Shay Shay. I am your host, Shannon Sharp. I'm also the proprietor of Club Shay Shay, and the guy that's stopping by for a drink and conversation today is a very close and personal friend of mine. He's a 19-year NBA vet. He's an all-star. He's a first-team all-defensive player. He's a chef, an actor, an author, a business owner, and he's the last enforcer. Please welcome Charles Oakley. Oak Tree, hey. how you doing? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on the show. I know I've been waiting. <laughs> okay, we, we talked about this. You wrote the book, The Last Enforce, Enforcer, outrageous stories from the life and times of one of the NBA's fiercest competitors. Oh, why did you decide to write a book and why now? Well, I mean, I've been, over the last 10 years, I've been deciding, you know, something that, you know, you're doing a lot of podcasts, you're doing a lot of interviews, you're doing a lot of talking, and people, you know, hear a lot about you, a lot of stirs, your journey, your life, you, you know, you, you know, I wouldn't say my grandfather in Alabama for a long time, who I got a lot of my ways from, mm -hmm. just being a humble guy, you know, guy who liked to give, a uh, guy who put a lot of work into whatever you do. And I just figured it was time for me to just get this story out, let everybody, you know, see the book, like stages of life. And I figured well, it's a good time now, it's a pandemic. People want just at home. They won't need stuff to do so they can get this book and really just see my consistency on my life uh, in the NBA, after my career, what I do in the inner city, get back to the kids, get back to whoever I can help out, foundation, all kind of ways. So this book will tell you all of my steps I'm doing right now. And the people can really just say, this is a, he this is a he hell of a story of what Oak doing. <laughs> <laughs> Not just off the court, just in this book, the structure way, you know, my guy Frank, who wrote it, right, just laid it all out. You set the record a long intro. Now, but Sorry. you set, but you set the record straight on a lot of stories from the 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 punching, the slapping of Charles Barkley, to almost getting in a fight with Judge Mathis, and so we're gonna get to those stories. Michael Jordan, right. who's a very close personal friend of yours, he arrived in Chicago a year earlier than you got there. Right. What did it mean to you to have him? Right the forward. It meant a lot. That shortened our relationship over the years, and we still friends, even though we don't hang out like we used to. Right. But it's just a love, it's just the love for one another. And uh, when I call him and ask him, he didn't question me. He said, "I have it to you in three or four days." He never asked for a copy of the book because he trusted me, and he know I've been there for him. I'm not gonna let him down now because of book. He wrote. When you're going through a tough situation, it always helps to have some protection, to have someone you can count on by your side, to have your back. For me, in the game of basketball, that was Charles Oakley. What does it mean to have him say that in a tough situation when I needed someone to have my back, I needed someone to stand beside me in the game of basketball, I knew I could count on Oak? Probably because when I got there, you know, being a rookie, and what I was doing and showing the veterans that I, I'm a guy who's going to do my job, be, be uh, on time, you can hold me accountable. Uh, this situation happened. I was around him a couple of times at high school as a young guy, I didn't worry about the veterans trying to, you know, use their force on me. Um, and it just grew from there. And uh, we've been in many places and I stay in my place, never try to, you know, show uh, I'm better than someone or better than him. I just, you know, I just learned how to play a role. And that's my whole thing in this book, is learn how to play a role on the court and off the court. Scotty Pippen just came out with a book. And obviously, and we thought, and from just watching it from a distance, that Scotty and Mike was very close. But knowing what we know now, had, had Scotty reached out to Mike and asked him to write the forward, Mike probably would have hung up the phone or said, hell no. What? What transpired? How did, how did we get here? You win six championships. You're the greatest duo ever. 
How do we get from winning six championships, being Batman and Robin, to adversary? Wow. Hey, great question. But uh, you know, in, in sports, there's a lot of guys who play together for a lot of years. They don't play for the friendship. They play for the win the championship and love the game. Right. So we're seeing this, this playing out a lot of way that um, – Magic, Kareem, maybe Shaq and Kobe, Nas Scott and Michael, and a few other guys. Yeah, they didn't get along, but they played together. They won a championship together. So right. I think in the last dance, I talk about this, but Jerry Krauss, uh, you know, I think I give him a lot of credit because he drafted me, being biased, but uh, I think he did a lot of work to put that team together. But for Mike and Scotty, I think it's something else besides the last dance because, yeah, Scotty, you know, they like, didn't give him a lot of headlines like they did Dennis Rodman or Curry, but I think Mike couldn't have won without Scotty. Uh, he had said that many a times, but I think Scotty, you know, whatever you say, you got to live with it and some things he said and, you know, things he did. Like, you know, he um, when he didn't want to go back in the game. He took a, he got hurt. He didn't take the, that summer to try to recover with a surgery. He waited till the season starts. So it's, people can point some fingers at him, like why, you know, all this now. But, you know, that's life. Well, you say, you got, he just got a little bit. I know that, uh, you know, he's saying he was better than Mike. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, here's a quote from uh, Pippen's book. He says, I may go as far as to say Mike ruined, ruined basketball. Kids wanted to be like Mike. Well, Mike didn't want to pass, didn't want to rebound or defend the best player. He wanted everything done for him. Right. I mean, Look, obviously you mentioned some of the players that played together, won a championship together, that were best friends. I don't know if any have gone as far as him to try to discredit what Mike has actually done. Now, but you can understand, oh, before you answer, you can understand why Pip got upset. He says, okay, you're doing the last dance. You add a part to the last dance that you weren't even part of the team. In 1994, you were playing baseball. So why would you bring me at my lowest moment into that situation? Well, when I, when I was always talking to Mike, you know, after every Monday, every Sunday, and I'd be talking to him Monday, his thing was they shouldn't have did it. I mean, and I'm saying, like, Mike, who's going to turn you down? You the go to basketball, as we see. But... I mean, Scotty, you know, Scotty, he felt hurt by the last dance. Yes. Because, I, you know, like I said, I, I, I mean, I looked at it, you know, like, yeah, they did pump Dennis Rodman up a lot. I mean, like you said, Batman and Robin. And so Dennis Rodman was, yeah, he was, he was, a, he was a great third wheel, but I think Scotty maybe should have got more play in a positive way. But like I said, yes. Mike had the more control. <laughs> and, and, he had, and he had his baller right there. So, <laughs> he was feeling good, and, and Scott, Scott, I think Scotty can't win the argument. He's better than Michael. He said that a lot of times. He's better than Michael, but he got a, he can always have a point of view about what he feel about what happened and how things happened. And that, he had to live with that. Yeah, because if you look at it, oh, two of the most prominent features of Scotty Pippen was refusing to go into the game, and he wouldn't have mm -hmm. surgery leading up to that, I think, was it the last season or second to the last season before this thing right. fell apart? So that's right. two negative portrayals of Scottie right. Pippen in something that was supposed to be positive. And so he's looking at it like, hold on, one of those times you weren't there and you're calling me selfish because I'm trying right. to get my money and I feel this is the only way I could go about it and get it, put some pressure on them to give me my money. Well, number one... <laughs> They weren't going to get more money because Jerry Ryan, Scotty should have known that Jerry Ronsoff wouldn't tell Michael Jordan the contract. They definitely were going to tell Scotty's. Correct. So that was the law's cause. <laughs> but I think Scotty said he wanted to fan, finance, you know, because his back was, you know, he had back problems. So that's why he signed it. But that's when they come back to Jerry Crowd. They, they blamed Jerry for some things, but Jerry had no power. Jerry yeah. was the scapegoat. Yes. So yes. My thing is, I know it got ugly, you know, because Scotty wrote his own book, won't tell his side of the story, but I think I say, I said the other day on TV, I don't think they'll never be friends again. No. I think the thing, you know what, I think what really hurt, not only the portrayal, not only uh, the not going in in 1994, I think the fact that when Michael said Scotty was being selfish, 
You could portray that, but he had never, heard, I don't think he had ever heard Mike utter those words, Scotty is being selfish. I think that really cut him deep. Well, yes. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's tough to say. Uh, I mean, some people said, you know, they can say what they want to say. Right. So then Scotty came back and said Mike was selfish because he retired on them. He left them hanging. Right. When he went to play uh, baseball. So both of them got questions and answers and whatever. But it's hard to say you're better than the best player of basketball and you ain't ranked in the top 25 in scoring. Right. <laughs> A great point. When you got, when you first, in 1995, when you arrived there, Mike had took, 85, had, 85 excuse me, 85. Mike had taken the league by storm. We had never seen yeah. a guy this young, be so acrobatic, fly through the air. He was doing uh, uh, 28 points a game. So when you get there, you understand what your role is and what you're going to need to do to play alongside Mike. What was the first thing that you thought when you saw Michael Jordan? Uh, wow. I mean, I'd seen him, you know, he, like I said, came in a year before I did. And my college coach, I knew Dean Smith, his coach, and he was telling me about Michael. Uh-huh. And, you know, so Dean Smith didn't let the cat out the bag. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he, he held kept him in the house. He kept him in the house, <laughs> but when he got to the league, he got out of the bag. So <laughs> when I first met him that August, because he was, you know, in the summertime, he ripped and run this and that. So he, he slowed down around August and come back to Chicago. So when I met him, we was playing pickup ball and this and that. You know, he greeted me when I first saw him. I greeted him, but I think he saw me in the pickup games. I, I, I played the same way, play on the court. So. <laughs> he probably was like, wow, this guy, this guy got some force with him. Cause I didn't just play just to be playing. I right. played with a purpose. Let people know they can they, they got to feel me at all time. But once that happened, training camp, we gotta be, you know, close a little closer. It was it was a road trip. And you know, the veterans back then, everybody was a little, you know, a little edgy. Right. And my couple of guys was like, you know, in practice the day before. We were at his practice, a couple guys, and he got into a little bit in practice. And, okay. it, and it carried over until okay. we was in Seattle, and, and guys got to the dinner table. We were sitting there talking, and this and that. And then the guy was still, you know, talking, this and that. And I think that um, when the check came, um, and they had one check, and Mike, like, okay, what is this? So all the guys, like, oh, you made the All Star team last year. Did you get the check? He said, no, you get paid. You get paid, you get paid. <laughs> now go in your pocket and pay this check. Okay. So <laughs> after this, you know, now attention started like, okay, yeah, look out for your guys. But it, it, it was kind of, it was a lot of tension in Chicago. You know, a lot of guys coming to practice, can't make it to the game because they was messing with that stuff. Right. He mentioned that in his book and a lot of people took offense to it, but he was telling the truth. Yeah, he mentioned that in the last dance. Like when he first got there, he goes in some vet's room and he sees powder, he sees alcohol, he sees yeah. weed, he sees women, and he's like, uh, "I've never been exposed to anything like this. How are we gonna win basketball games if y'all doing this before the game?" Yeah, I seen some of it too. But as like I said, my rookie year, I seen a little bit of that. But then my third, second, third year, they start getting clearing them guys out. Well, they start clearing stuff out. Stuff starts coming back, and Mike started getting more Mike and control to our more control of what the situation was. At first, it was all over everywhere. Right. You mentioned that Mike had saw uh, in a pickup game. Mike had come back to Chicago, and you're playing pickup ball. He's watching you play. Do you think him watching you play, seeing your physicality, seeing your toughness, kind of rubbed off on him? Well, good question. I don't know if it rubbed off then, but he knew that he had somebody he probably, could, if something happened, uh, he had somebody he probably knew it had his back. But I think later on in my career, you know, my second, you know, not the first, but the second and third, that, wow, this guy's really what I saw, I saw in the training, you know, working out that summer. But he saw my consistency that I'm here to stay or whatever. I'm not taking no trash. So, and I think that it did rub off of him because I seen like him, like I said, he wasn't outgoing like he, he was late on in his career, but I can see he can pick up some of my attendees from where he playing and, and what he's doing on the court and what he's doing around the guys. Right. So we, you, you're like, okay, going into a game, and you know how guys are. So you mentioned that the check comes around. You guys at dinner in Seattle, the check comes around, 
and they looking at Mike, okay, bro, you getting all the attention, you making the money, you Air Jordan, you got the sneakers, bro, pick up the tab. So do you feel that some of his own teammates have started to be resentful, started to be jealous of Mike, of, of the attention and notoriety that he was starting to get? Well, it started in the All-Star game with Isaiah, Magic, George Gervin, and all of them. But like I said, them guys was in the league two, three years before Mike, and a lot of them was more cool. So the word got around. Right. And, you know, we had Atlanta Warriors. We had Quinn Daly. We Big had, and we had some guys to score. Right. So the ball, you know, when you got three or four guys score, there were so many shots left over. <laughs> so they was, the competition was, they were trying to outdo him. He was the clever one. You know, he, he he was just so good, it just came natural. So that he they ended up getting them out of there. They right. saw what they had and building a team, and you see what happened later on, and once they built Jerry Krause built their team, they won six championships. You mentioned in your book, and I've read the book, and it's a very good read. Like I said, some of the things, having known you for almost 30 years, some of the things I knew because you and I have shared right. in private, and some of the things that I didn't know. You mentioned that there was a trade. They traded. I forget who they traded, but they uh, they broke the team. But one of his close friends, Higgins, Rod Higgins, I think that's who it was. Rod Higgins. They traded right, Rod, Rod Higgins, Higgins. but they tra- and they traded for George Gervin. And when when mm-hmm. Iceman got there, first of all, Mike was not fond of the trade because he and Rod Higgins were very cool. He also wasn't go. he also wasn't fond because you mentioned that George Gervin, Magic, Isaiah, although Isaiah is the one that gets gets most of the blame for freezing Jordan out the All Star game. You mentioned it with several other guys also that played a role that didn't get the criticism or the backlash that Isaiah got. What was it about well, Ice that that kind of rubbed Jordan the wrong way? I mean, I mean, you bringing a veteran in there, and like I said, all that was an All Star game years, you know, a couple years before that. So my thing and Mike, like, why are you bringing this guy in? You know, I know he, you know, Mike ended up getting hurt that year and then right. come back to the playoffs. But when Mike came back, you know, George Gervin went to the bench. But I know they didn't know what was really going on between them guys and All-Star and Mike. Right. But it came out that that would happen. But Isaiah was the main leader. Right. So they didn't want Jordan to take all the fame. They was in the league two or three years. And right. you see what was happening. This guy's a rookie, make the All-Star team and, and do what he was doing. Right. Oh, yeah. They was afraid. And he did take over. <laughs> he, he, he did take over. <laughs> Okay, let's go back to the beginning. You was born in you was born in Cleveland. I was born in right. Chicago. You went down to live with your grandparents in rural Alabama. Is there right. any big any big parts of Alabama? All of it rural. If you ask if you ask me, but you went right. to live with your grand you went to live with your grandparents because right. if I'm not mistaken, you got nine brothers and sisters, correct? No, it's six of us. Six of us. Excuse me. Six. You got six brothers and sisters, and your mom six. sent you and one of your sisters. My youngest. Yes. To Alabama until she can right. get, get better on her feet so she can have right. a bigger right. place so all of you guys can be together. So you go down right. to Alabama. You get down there. What's the first thought that goes through your mind? Hey, I'm still with family. Young, like, See, it wasn't just we went down there. I already had, like, my grandfather was, the, you know, he was the man of uh, the town or whatever you want to call it, but I had other aunts. And other cousins down there, but my grandmother, and grandfather, they had a house, they had two, three rooms, and before I left down there, my grandfather had three more rooms. But no, it was other family members there too. So Beth, we was taken care of in all kind of ways. Right. But my grandfather was in the field, the church, yeah, man who take people to town, yeah. So you know, we watched him every day, watch his craft, what he was doing. It was amazing, and uh, I had a good time because I was still around my family, you know, and. Uh, I didn't. I couldn't tell what was going on because I was a kid. Right. But uh, you know, I have no regret because they treated me just like I was one of the kids down there. That's the best part about it because I was raised by my grandparents in, in rural South Georgia, and you're right. You got a big extended family, a lot of first cousins, a lot of second cousins. Yeah. They come over. We playing football, playing basketball, playing tag, playing chase. So I'm having. I, we having us a good old time, and it, it and watching my grandfather work in the field. And to see the discipline and the dedication, it let me right. knew, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. You doing all this right. hard work 15 hours a day and we ain't barely yeah. got anything to show for it. I was like, nah, this yeah. ain't for me. Yeah, you exactly right. Cause uh, and that's how he that's how he did until he when he left here. He was working still because that's all he knew. Right. How to get back and make sure everybody was okay around him. And 
I, I was able to get away from Chicago for one day to go to his service and be back. Back then, you get one day and come back. Now they get two months. Yeah, you know? they, they call it bereavement. Take time. They call it they take their time. They call it bereavement <laughs> leave. So you could, you know, you take as much time as you need, but you're right. You got a day, you got a day and a half to get there and get back. Oh, when you, yeah. if you, but the old school, because you're a couple of years older than I am. In that situation, old people didn't play. There was no, there was no BSing around. My grandpa used to tell okay. my brother and I, don't make me chew my food twice. What he was saying, don't make me repeat myself. So he tell you well, something one time, that was it. That's it. Hey, if you, when you read the book, you heard, you see the story I said, my grandfather knocked the mule out. Because he told the mule, the mule, he, when he said get up, that mean move. Yeah. And he said it twice. He went and, two story, he knocked the mule out. I know he, he didn't, he didn't turn the crop over that day, but he got a foreign crop. <laughs> that's how the most, they say the mule, you had to tell him G and Hawk, because my grandfather had mules also. Grew up on the farm a lot like your family. So when you did you work in the fields? Did you do any work in the fields? Oh, work? yeah, I worked in the field. So sometime you were here in a wagon, so that mule got a lot of work. So we had to go up the road about two and three, two or three miles. Right. So when we get up the road, you get the white fence. You know what the white fence means? We got to throw the hay, feed the cow, feed the horses. Right. So we used to do that. And then we would come back down the road. We do it like two days a week. When we come back down the road, we had an auntie. My grandfather would never go past. The, when he go down, he'll never stop. On the way back, he gonna stop until it get dark. And then once it get dark, he gonna leave and come back home. But every time, that's the one who made the tea cakes, boy. <laughs> you know what I saw? When they made them tea cakes. They oh, taste good. Oh yeah. Hey, I think you gotta get hey, them hot though. I think, oh, I, I think my great aunt. I think she would put some snuff in it. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. Oh, they don't know anything about snuff. I know about snuff. My grand, okay. my grandfather used to. Uh, my grandmother <laughs> dipped blue navel. My grandmother, uh, my, uh, my that raised me, dipped her uh, honey. Right. Oh man. So I Boy, know. Them, hey, them, hey, them tea cakes. Oh, um, <laughs> they look just like. Uh, they look. Hey, they look just like um, peanut butter cake. But yeah. them tea cakes had a different kick to them. <laughs> oh, you said <laughs> I, I'm reading your story here. You said you picked cucumbers, loaded tomatoes. Did you do like, did you bail hay? Did you, did they have to oh, tobacco, yeah. peanuts? No. I did worse. I, I picked cotton. Oh, did I picked cotton. We didn't I have was that. about six, seven, I was picking cotton. So basically, you know, your grandparents, all of them at work. Um, we, we either, you get a ride about eight miles away from the house. So the father never doesn't know you, but by the time you walk back, it'd be time for dinner. So if you ain't come back with something in your hand, you ain't eat dinner. So they just drop us off. We had no choice. We had to pick the we had to pick the cotton. You know how yes. like cotton wool. Maybe yes. we have about three bags, we'll have a two pounds. Exactly. <laughs> and like, it, and if you got three bags, you think at least got $60. You got about $3.50. <laughs> so but that was fun though. What what did working in those fields, that manual, hard, grueling labor, because you're yeah. going out there, it's early. We call it can't the can't. When you went out there, you couldn't see in the morning. And when you got done, right. you couldn't see at night. What right. did that teach Charles Oakley that, what did it teach you about work, hard work, discipline, dedication, determination? It taught me everything. It taught me everything because down there you had to do it. Uh, you couldn't come in and eat, and I wanted to eat. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it just it really just gave me some discipline in my life that hey, no matter what you do and what way you go, work gonna be involved. Yeah, you got to do it the next point. Yeah, hard work too. That's you what know, I talk about in the book. A lot of work, a lot of consistency. You got to be consistent too. You know. Oh, you know what? You and I, uh, like I said, we've known each other for such a long time. Right. You're a provider. Because what happens is, is that you grow up and you see how hard right. your grandparents are working. And you right. say, you know what? I got to make sure I take care of a lot of people. So you get yeah. at an early age. I remember making $25 a week. I would take $10 and give to my grandmother. Well, you can buy right. something. You can pay for something. And as I right. got older, it gave me a sense of pride that, man, here I am, right. 8, 9, 10 years old, and I'm helping my grandmother with bills. Yeah. Well, you know, I was... Like I said, I was going back and forth, but as I grow like into the NBA, like my high school, I got a summer job. Right. You know, like, you know, you, you minimum wage job for the summertime, doing this and that, two months of summer. But once I got into the league, college, I had a little job. But once I got to the league, my first thing I did was, you know, you always take care of your, your mother, your aunts, and your I mean, Every time I go down south or whatever, 
that somebody who helped me raise me, I always try to give them something. You know yep. what I'm saying? Take them a picture, go in town, buy them wild medals, give them a couple hundred dollars, five hundred dollars. Yep. So I spoil my aunts and people who raised me. Yes. And to this day, I'm I, every time I go there, I'm giving them something, and you know, to help the kids go to college down there. Other other cousins coming up, and that's what you're supposed to do. I mean, to a point, you know. Now, when they start asking for something three or four times, you got you know, you got to you gotta put the break. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, and uh, but uh, basically, I did that early. I said, I, I, I said it like when I got into the league. I said, you know what? I came home. My sister and brother, I you know, take care of them every Christmas, every summer. Right. But then I said, you know what? I'm gonna lay the law down. You got to. Oh, remember what you get. Don't spend it all in one place. You know, you go to the bank and the money getting low. Just you gotta, you gotta just. I have to just. So right. careful what you do with it. Now, do you want me to give you a, a, a little month, or you want it twice a year? So you know, you gotta just make some rules and get a little with it. And you know, a lot of friends in the streets, this and that, went to school with me. I still had to tell them. That's why I said I ain't changing my number. My number been the same thirty something years. So I'm gonna either yes or no. I ain't gonna go send you to the uh, voicemail. I'm gonna answer the phone. Right. You know. That's how I operate. That's how I am, okay? I used to go back home and all the home is to be standing on the corner. I go get pizza. I go get beer. We they we eat pizza. I sit there and talk with them. Yeah. They get ready to go do something foul. They're like, hey, Sharp, we about to go make a move, man. You go ahead and move up out of here. That was telling me, okay, hey, you yeah, out. You we go. want you to stay out, but we still go do what we do. We appreciate you not changing who you are. You still Shannon from, from Glenville, and you still treat us the same. And so right. for me, that 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 meant a lot to me that they still thought enough of me to keep me out of harm's way. Oh yeah, I, I had a lot of friends the same way. Well, my brother was, you know, was the big guy in Cleveland, this and that, and a lot of family members. I had an uncle had like seven gas stations, but we still had to do our own thing, get your own money, do this right. and that. But my brother, you know, carried a lot of weight, so a lot of people know how we roll as a family. We don't take no mess. My right. brother didn't take no mess. I didn't take no mess, and. <laughs> my grandpa definitely made a mess. So right. Everybody got to understand that they, excuse me, it is what it is. You know, we just, I mean, we we figured it out. And like I said, mom's still living, you know, my pa passed from an early age, but we still got a lot of family members. And uh, I try to go, like I say, it's been a bad time in the last couple of years with the pandemic, but life, they stand healthy and stand strong. As a kid, what was your favorite sport growing up? Um, Football. I was football. I love football. You know, you know, down south, you, you said you got a basketball, you got a rock, and you got a football. So <laughs> we were playing on concrete with football. You right. know, three on three, two on two. And um, and that's what we did, you know. Like I said, we we kept active, you know. Then we you know, in the swamp, we go to the swamp. My cousin had a car, you get a two by four, that'd be the diving board, they jump in the they jump in the water. <laughs> so we had fun. I mean, you in the south, you gotta have fun. I mean, you, unless yeah. you just something wrong with the person. Yeah, because uh it ain't it like you going water, to the mall. Huh? You're not getting in no car going to the mall in the south. You no, better find you, you better find something to do all <laughs> Hey, it, you, when you go to town, you when you go to town, boy, you be like, man, in about two miles after you leave town. Hey, you start getting dark, you know you're going back to the woods. <laughs> oh, boy, I can tell you from the country, because that's what we call it. Oh, who want to go uptown? <laughs> <laughs> what what position What position did you play in football? I played defense in. Uh, I played peewee ball. I came, I came from Alabama to play peewee ball. And, and then uh, in high school, I played defense in and uh, tight end. But uh, we had, a, I mean, I had more scholarships Probably the same in football and basketball. I chose to play basketball. Uh, Tim McGee played high school. He went to Cincinnati Bingo for like yeah. 10 years. We played on the same team. And Hancock went to my school. John Hicks went to my school. We had a lot of football pros come out of there. Right. So is that where your mentality come from in basketball? Because you play basketball like football. You be sitting you yeah, said hard I mean, picks. <laughs> I, I, told, I, I tell everybody the same. The, like Pat Riley had a rule: the whistle don't blow, keep playing. The ball can still be out of bounds, but keep playing. If you don't hear a whistle, keep playing. But uh, now I got some of that toughness definitely from football and my grandfather. But uh, football, we used to do that monkey roll. You know, when it rain, yeah, and they make this, you know, monkey roll. I don't and think man, they, I don't I think they do that anymore. Oh, I don't think they make them do that anymore. <laughs> they don't the do monkey rolls. No, nah, they don't do monkey <laughs> rolls. They don't make them do. They don't make them do Oklahoma. 
Yeah, but I'm just saying, but we were doing that at high oh, school. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It was but, like you know how the pig, you know how the pigs down south used to be on, 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 oh, yeah. in the mud. In the mud. Yeah, that's how the, that's how we were doing. <laughs> Jumping over one another. It was gonna make you tough. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah, so I don't know what they're doing. That's I, they need to show it to the NBA playoffs these days because they, you know, a little soft or soft. You chose to go to Virginia. You you said you want to get out of Cleveland. Right. Um, a lot of crime. Uh, at at that point in time when you were coming out of high school, one of the highest murder rates in the right. U.S. You saw a man get shot four times trying to rob a, 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 a trying to hit basically trying to hit a right. lick. Trying to hit a lick when he was gonna get, he was gonna get stuck anyway the next day, but because the guys <laughs> in there didn't play. I don't know what happened. I guess he woke up on the wrong side of bed. Yeah, I just I went down to school at Virginia Junior Historic Black College. I had a ball for four years. Um I went I went away. I only came home one time, Shannon, in four years. Really? I just wanted to get out of Cleveland like that. Yeah, one time in four years. I wasn't homesick or nothing. I was used to being away, but it was a lot of crime. A lot of my guys was getting in trouble, going to jails. And to this day, some of them just not coming home the last four or five years. Oh, they did 20 some years in jails. It's, it's, wow. it's, it's just crazy. Yeah. But I made it out. And, uh, yeah. but you know, it was tough, but I, I hung in there. Like I said, I knew how I knew how to survive because I've been around my grandfather. And right. um, I got a little job. But then the crazy story was, my, you know, I was hanging with my brother once I got a little older. Like you said, when I seen the guy, the guy who shot, it was like, it was just crazy because the week before I was with my brother in a place, something similar to that, but I'm with my brother, you know, and I'm not gonna try them. But these guys stay around the corner from me in Cleveland. And I was just gonna go around there and, you know, take a thousand, I, you know, knock, we had made a lick and I was gonna take a thousand dollar right and try my luck. So I walked in the house and they, you know, come on in. I never got a chance to even get in the dice. It was a dice game. And this, right. this guy robbed it. And, he, you know, I didn't know him, but the other six guys in the, in the house knew him. So I was just standing by, you know, in them houses in the old days, you know, at them choppy basements. So I was just leaning back on the pole. And I couldn't believe that he was trying to rob the game. And next thing I know, one of those guys who knew my brother hit him about four times. And I just got on out of there. I never got in the game. <laughs> oh. It, it, it was crazy because... You know, I'm like, wow. Right. It was just crazy. But that, you know, you always have to be careful of a cash game. You always have to look for somebody trying to lay it down. Yeah. You playing dice, yeah. you playing cards. Anywhere there's money, yeah. somebody looking yeah. to hit a lick. But that that was just, they said, they don't know why the guy did it. Because like I said, everybody didn't know him. But another he got time, I was about 13 years old. Huh? He got desperate. He probably was on that sauce. You know that sauce make you do well, things, though. Yeah, you, you could have been sauce, but my thing is, because when I walked in the basement, he was on the dice for about 20 minutes, so he hit about three numbers, so it could have been the money, so I don't know. So he might have had it in his mind anyway before right. he even made the difference. So one time I was in the playground, I was about 13, and it's a crazy story here. Um, I was about 13, so it's, you know, it's four courts, and one end of the court, like on Friday, guys, you know, they get the check and go cast their check. They could come back with them 40s and have that wine and have some you know, old English. <laughs> yeah. So about four or five of them were shooting dice. And this guy was named, it was Railroad, I think. And uh, he came in the bus yard. I'm, I'm looking, I see a guy with a switch. This guy robbed the crap gang with the switch. What? And nobody even run or nothing. Yeah. But this was one of them guys, though. I guess he didn't have his thing with him. He had a switch. Then nobody even tried to run or nothing. Because if he would, if, if they would have ran away, he would have seen them sooner or later. So they just said, we'll just take this law. So I went home and told my brother. He said, he ain't messed with you, did he? I was like, no, nah, I'm good. He said, forget them. <laughs> it was just crazy seeing somebody rock, take these guys money with a switch. Hold on. A switch that you guys whip like when you're great you whip? <laughs> yeah, yeah, off the tree. I'm like, man, oh man, them some soft guys. But it was, it was crazy. It was just how it was when I was growing up. They were doing stuff like that. But oh, here's the thing: you go to Virginia Union, which is in Richmond. Richmond at right. the time had a high, a very high, high crime rate, also. Yes. So you yes. felt safer in Richmond than you did Cleveland. No, I didn't feel safer, but I was just on campus. But my first week there, I got into with some guys off campus, so. My first week, you know how it is. You come in two or three days, all the freshmen go here and there. And yep. Then that Saturday, now that Friday night, they got a place that's called Henderson Center. So you go from maybe like from eight to 11, all the students go there, you know, just meet and greet. Yeah. So some kind of way, some guys from campus snuck in there. From and, off you know, campus. Rich, yeah. Like I said, 
and for Richmond, they snuck in there because my, my school, Richmond, is there. it wasn't gated or nothing. It was as you can say, walk on campus, yeah, like shortcut to the store, anything. So yep. it was it was kind of bad in a way. But anyway, something happened to one of the guys at school. So we just had met, and you know, we you know, at school, you know, everybody hang together. Yes. But one thing led to another this guy getting to another guy, about three or four of them. So we all surround them and we get into it with them. So the word was when the guy on the basketball team knew the guys. And they said, who's the tall guy? And they were talking about me. And they said, well, tell him he better not come to the football game tomorrow. And I'm like, I'm on campus. I mean, if something happens to me on campus, it's going to happen. So when it got a little out of hand. They were some they were some bangers, but my guy on the team ended up straightening it out. But still, though, it could have been a problem, you know? Right. Okay. Yeah. There was a game. Fair, Virginia Union, Fayetteville State. I think you wrote the book <laughs> that you, you wrote down to Fayetteville State. We used to play Fayetteville State, so I know what Fayetteville, North Carolina is. It's, you know, a good, it's a good little drive from Richmond, though. So you drive yeah. down to the game. You and a homeboy. The yeah. football team get to fighting. You're in yeah. the stands. You come out the stands and go on the field and start wilding out with them. Are you out your mind? Oh, <laughs> no. I was swinging. I was, they had help. I was swinging. They, they, they couldn't believe it. That's a big story, too. They was, hey, we got it. They couldn't believe it. But that's a, that was just love. That's what I'm known for. If you go going, I'm with you. I got to go with you. I, they couldn't believe it. Oh. Hey, let me tell you another story, too, Shannon. When I, you go trip out. So I had to do a deposition in Vegas because, you know, I got into the security guards up there, right? right? Yeah. So they got me in the room, asked me all these questions. Guess what they asked me? What they so what happened you ran on the field in Fayetteville in college? <laughs> how do y'all know that? I swear, my, how y'all know that? I couldn't believe they asked that question, man. A deposition, man. It was crazy, though. But it, that <clears throat> happened. It was fun, though. I had a good time. Oh, you talk about, you talk about if you if you wish, if I'm with you, I'm with you. But you weren't with yeah. them. You was in the stands. That was a football team. Hey. I was with them though. I drove down there. I was with them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they, hey, they had the, hey, on that jersey said B U U. And I went to B U U. Everything, everything Virginia <laughs> Union. Everything Virginia Union. That's what we do. Ask anybody went to Union, what we do. That's what we do. Norfolk got the same thing in the basketball game. They had a ride at Norfolk State. I mean, a couple guys got stomped down there and this and that. I ran back out of the locker room. The coach tried to grab me. I ran back out there. They couldn't hold me back. But it was <laughs> it was crazy. They, they stumped with our guys, so we had to get them back. Right, Playing basketball or not. <laughs> you tell the story of that you're in Richmond and you see Moses Malone, who comes back in a Rolls Royce. Yes. So I'm in the college, you know Moses Malone from Petersburg, Virginia, and uh, you know Mo, what him? He come up in a Rolls Royce. Well, okay, I heard okay. Well, okay. You know, my college roommate was telling, oh, okay, over there, this is that. So he go give me, yeah, I'm Moses Malone. I'm from Petersburg, Virginia. So ever since then, me and Moe been cool. <laughs> Moses Malone come looking for you. Hey, that's a good thing. Yeah, that's you know, a very good thing. He came to show me the love. And he didn't, he didn't have to. He, right. I'm just glad he, because my name was out there when I was in the union, because I was, you know, I was giving him the business, but it was a small school. Right. But uh, Moses Malone would drive on campus in the Rose Royce and said me, oh, man, I love, hey. I love Mo to this day. Rest in peace, Moses. Let me ask you this. When did you realize that, you know what? I'm at a small school, but hell, I can play in the NBA. I can, I can do it. Well, in this book, my thing is, I didn't look at school like that. I was just having fun. And, you know, my junior year, yeah, I had a good number. My last year, I was like 24 and 17. And um, they started said, well, we're going to invite you to some tournaments. So I went to the PIT. I got 35 and 20, you know. Then the next game, we put Sam Mitchell on our team, but we beat him. So down there, you always pick up a player. So after I did that, they, they invited me to the Hawaii Classic, you know, against all the top 20 in, in the country. I held my own. And they, they invited me to the East and West All-Star game. That's like the top 20 of the, coming out of the draft, top 10, top 20 players. I held my own. And then when the draft came around, they called me and said, well, you might be in the top four round, four, you know, four in the top four round. And and I said, well, you know, I didn't go to New York. Next thing they called me, said, you might be in the top three round. Then the next thing the top two. Man, I am going top 10. <laughs> I didn't even go to, hey, I didn't even go to the draft because they said the fourth round. Why would I go to the draft? I'm coming out in the fourth round. From a historic black college. 
I've been I've been embarrassed. Like they probably was like, why are you coming up anyway? You weren't gonna go the first round. So <laughs> hey, you never hey, when you put hard work, when you work hard and do your things right, good things happen. But you know, oh, having having trained with you, and a lot of people don't know this, you used to come back yeah. to Atlanta and you would train yeah. with the football guys, you on the track running, you out there lifting, yeah. and I'm looking like, hold on. I remember that first, I was like, hold on, that's Charles Oakley. Why the hell he out here running with us? And you keep it up yeah. with the football players. You come to the gym. Hey, yeah. what, what time y'all lifted today? I'm like, you gonna live? You coming to the gym? You're like, yeah. Yeah. I was dedicated. You know, y'all running them one tens and all that stuff <laughs> on the track. Yeah. I have, I mean, my thing is, I never turn down work. And that's probably why I last so long. It's probably, you know, you last so long. You're, right. it, it, it's your craft playing football. And I think that, you know, playing 82, 82 to 100 games a year and still be able to get up without any you know, aches and pains. You got to put work in. Yeah. Oh, you played with two Hall of Fame players. You played with Michael Jordan. You played with Patrick Ewing. Obviously, one was a big. The other was a guard. But outside of the positions that they're played, what are the biggest differences in Patrick wow. Ewing and, 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 and Mike? I mean, Michael was more of a sexy player. He's a, he's a wing guy. He can rebound, bring the ball down, and make plays and make things look easy. He's a bigger guy. Running straight down the middle of the floor, got to wait for you to bring the ball. You got to wait for him to get in the right position. So I mean, it's, it's like night and day. Um, you know, I think that now is why you don't see a lot of centers in the game. The more everybody won't stretch fours, stretch five, right, can make the three. So it was a big difference. I mean, Michael was the it factor. Patrick was just a player. But you said in the book, you said Michael is an A player, Patrick is a B player. We yeah. never had a true A player on the Knicks. I mean, if you look at, like, most teams are going to give somebody whoever the best, like the Knicks right now, Julius Randle is the A player, with, you know, because they don't have nobody else. He really a, a, a B player, but they right. don't have an A player. I mean, Patrick was skilled, can do a lot of things, but I think that once he got to the NBA, he didn't do the things he did at Georgetown right. uh, for his physicality, you know. Uh, I mean, we played hard, you know, and kept ourselves in a lot of games and this and that. And he, I mean, he make he got all the accolades, the dream team, all star, all this and that, top fifty player of all time. I mean, like I said, you got to like draft these days. They got to draft somebody because they got to they got to pick. But right. Patrick was he was good, but I mean, he wasn't a keen on you know a guy. Keen could carry a team and put a team on his back because he was so agile and he knew how he was better. I think his IQ was better than Patrick. What's your relationship like with Patrick? Or do you in communication? Um, do you guys talk? I mean, my relationship with Patrick, I took care of Patrick for 10 years. I mean, I had his back, was there for him. Um, we did great things together. Like we went to, 10, we went to um, 10 playoffs together in New York. We never could win the championship, but we got there, we couldn't win it. Um, I, one thing really hurt me was with Patrick was when that thing happened in New York, he didn't come up to uh, my rescue in no kind of way. And that's just kind of sad, you know, for someone to play together for 10 years. And I mean, maybe why I'm talking more about him now, because hey, when you play with somebody for 10 years and give them your heart, so I sacrificed my game. I took less shot. I took charges. I dive in the stand. I mean, I did all the dirty work. And right. when someone did something to me and you play, you should know me. If you play with me 10 years and something happened, and if I call you and say I'm wrong, if I don't call you and tell you I'm wrong, you got to go to war for me. Right. Point blank. You guys do make it. You made you made it to one NBA Finals, 1994. That was the weird year Jordan had stepped away from the game. Right. Do you wish you could have gone through Jordan to say put that to rest because they say, well, yeah, you went to the Finals, but Jordan was gone. And do you do you wish what would you have done? What would you have liked to see the Knicks do differently? Because you had a three-two lead going back right. going going to uh, Houston. Houston. Yes. Um. I mean, it's come up a series that we was up, we was up two zero one time. I just think. Um, you know, we got Pat Riley as our coach, and I think that uh, we got called up. I think sometimes Pat Riley got called into Phil Jackson motion and not the team. What we trying to do is win as a team. Right. And I think that hurt us a couple of times, but we was right there. But we know what? We could, we could never get the big bounce, never got the call. Right. And, uh, and we, in, in this sport, you know that sometimes you got to get the ball got to bounce that way and, you, and a play got to go your way. We never got that. For some reason, I don't know with the Minnesota Vikings, uh, I don't know the Buffalo Bills, but <laughs> something, <laughs> you know, these teams, Buffalo went, what, four years in a row, Minnesota yep. Vikings yep. went about four or five times. Sometimes it just ain't meant for you, but uh, 
I was hey, we we was fighting for it, but what can you do? The ball got to go in to win. Right. When you got traded from the Bulls to the Knicks, do you believe had you stayed on the Bulls, you guys would eventually won a championship like they did when they got caught right? No doubt. With Michael Jordan and Scottie Mature and Horace, that team definitely was going to win. You, you can see it coming. Like a train down south, like they said, if you, if you put your head against the railroad track, you know the train coming. You hear it. So <laughs> <laughs> you can hear it. So, <laughs> yeah, I thought it, that, that team definitely was going to win. I don't know if it would have won six, but it would have won one or two. If you'd, had a, if you'd had the so-called A player in New York, do you believe you could have won a championship in New York if you'd had an A player? Oh, yes. I think if Patrick would have played the same way he played in Georgetown, we would have won. I think he didn't bring that attention on defense because, you know, on defense can determine how your offense going to go sometimes. Right. But I think if he would have played the same way, goaltending, blocking shot, putting people on their back, like Georgetown, we could have won one. But like I said, you know, we – I think sometimes we um, we sell it too much. You know, we we didn't do the right thing sometimes in coaching. I mean, like I said, when we played the Bulls, some most of the games came down to one or two possessions. Right. And, uh, and, they, and then they said when, when t- that type of game, most time the team with the best player going to win, and and they had the best player. <clears throat> At the beginning of the book, this is how you start the book off. I did not punch Charles Barkley. I repeat, I did not punch. Charles Barkley. I did slap the you-know-what out of Charles Barkley. Yeah, true statement. I did smack the you-know-what out of him at the NBA lockout. But at one point in time, he gave you great credit. What transpired over the course of five, ten years that changed that you were were cool? I'm not saying y'all was best of friends. You were cool. You were cordial to you walking up to the man and slapping him. Well, that was probably after I smacked him. (laughs) <laughs> but it was no, it was the it was the lockout. It was just you know he had touched me in my face, and you know I don't play that. Um, I don't know where his hand bends, and he's a grown man. I'm a grown man. I can't let you get away with that. Don't play with me. I didn't never play with nobody, and that's one thing I try to tell people. You know, people always come and ask, ask you a thousand questions. I, I ain't got time to ask a thousand questions. Just say hello. If you know me, you already know about me. So right. <laughs> it's just a lot of things happen. He talked too much. I mean, he was a, he was a great player. I gave him that. Uh, but besides that, I ain't give him nothing else. That when I when he see me, he better go the other way. That's what I'm gonna give him that. Well, hold on. It was I read in the book that he kept saying that guy's you were on steroids. Mm, well, I wasn't that big, so I, don't I guess know. because he you were so strong. About- because you were so strong. <laughs> oh, he might have been talking. He might have been talking about Carl Malone, but no. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh. You do realize you don't have normal strength for a basketball player. You no. you're a height of a basketball player, but you right. got strength like a football player. I've seen yeah. you in the gym. Yeah. We worked out together. Oh, we've been on the yeah. track together. You're not like the average basketball player. Well, back in the days, I just do three fifteen ten times. So exactly. I three three. I, I got the three seventy five. So I guess I'm you know, but still. Um, I mean, he was he was better than me, athletic, you know, scoring points. But I had to just do what I had to do on the court. I mean, I had to protect myself and make sure that every night when I went out, I had my team back. And you know, my job was to shut down the paint. But for me and him personal, I mean, I have seen him out several times. But y'all, 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 y'all cool now? Nah, because he on probably on TNT talking about why he talking about me in the book. I'm gonna keep talking about you. So <laughs> car, I got a car wash and on clothes. So keep coming, come to car wash, Thomas. <laughs> okay, <laughs> tell the story about Ty. I, hold on, I'm just trying to figure out this story about Tyrone Hill. You lend Tyrone Hill. It's a car game. You lend Tyrone yeah. Hill twenty grand in Atlanta. In Atlanta. Now this is what I know about you. All right. Let me tell. I, I want to tell the story. I had a, I had I had one of the first two thousand I had one of the first seven sixty. Yeah. You came to town. You yeah. saw the, I had just got the car. I had fifty miles on the car. You like man? I want I want to buy that car. I like huh? I just I said oh I just got the car. He said I want to buy it. You tell you called me tell me to come up to the, at the time it was the Ritz Carlton in Buckhead. Buckhead I come yeah. I come up to the four, I come up to Ritz Carlton. <laughs> I drive the car up there. You like okay I will take it. I'm like what you mean you gonna take it? You like here? You gave me one hundred twenty-five thousand cash. You yeah. took me back home. You say, "Hey, do me a favor. 
leave the insurance on it till Tuesday, till I get to where I'm going. I'll change right. the insurance over and I call you back. Right. That Tuesday you called me, you good, you peace, and that was it. So I know right. you have you. Ha I know I, you probably don't carry money on you like that now. So I know you right. were good for the money. You had the money on you. Why wouldn't the man right. give you the money back? Well, it was a problem that uh, he said he was going through a divorce. And I said, really? I said, who mad your ass, number one? So uh, one thing led to another. We in training. We in, it's, so the training camp stuff. We, we in uh, North Carolina. We playing somebody. Right. So um, they in their layup line. I get, out, I get out of my team layup line and get in their layup line <laughs> just to get the just to get the rebound to get to him and okay. let him know that I'm in the building. Okay. So it was so funny. All the guys were laughing like, oh, you're in the wrong line. I said, no, I'm not. So when he do his, the other team do the layup, but time for me to get the ball to him, he looking at, oh, shit. he thought he's seen a ghost. <laughs> but this man just kept kind of duck. It started until the season. The season started. Okay. That's the crazy part. So the season started, we played Philly. He, in, he on Philly now, because he was playing with Cleveland. So he in Philly. So the first game, da, da, da. We play him in New York. He don't show up. Next time we go to Philly. Um, so I get there early. Go, you know, probably get there before six. I could do like five thirty, quarter six. So right. I get some flowers in my locker, and somebody sent me some flowers. I looked at them. So it says to Charles Oakley. So I told the top ball, and I said to Tyrone Hill from Charles Oakley. So I gave the ball boy a hundred dollars to take these and put them in Tyrone Hill locker. Okay. So <laughs> I, put it like, I said, stay in there to see the reaction once he see it. So he came in, da da da. He was gonna play that night. He came in the locker room, da da da, this and that. So the, he said, "Ball boy." So he walked to the door. He started smiling, seeing the flowers. He, got, he went to his locker, and then he opened up the thing and said, and started reading it. Ball boy said he threw a thing down and just started coughing. So he went home. He left the arena, went home, and played sick. Come on, oh. Yes, yes. You writing the book? Sick. You writing the book? That when you finally were able to approach him, you say, uh, uh, he told you, Oak, I'm going through it, because right now I'm going through a divorce. Your words right. were divorce, who married your ugly ass? <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, yeah. you out your mind, yeah. <laughs> So as it went on to the season, Larry Brown, people started like, why is Tyrone not showing up? So it got big. So he tried to, the first game of the playoff. He came by, man, what are you doing this? You know I was going through this. And I said, man, I got nothing to do with it. You know, you make more money than me. Da, da, da. So he said, I got your money. So he handed me the money. I'm looking at, I said, what is this? <laughs> I, I said, you know I got charred juice on my money. <laughs> <laughs> so I threw him with the money, hit him with money, and got the car. Next day he came back and gave me 30000 <laughs> I charged him shit extra. So, so he he finally paid you your money. Yeah. Oh yeah. He had to pay. <laughs> okay. Now you get into it. You're at, as a matter of fact. At this time, you're playing with the Wizards. Mm -hmm. You're talking to someone in Charlotte, a female. You don't mention the name in the book. You mention yeah. the fee. Now, this is what I do know about you. You drive it damn near everywhere. It ain't. It ain't. <laughs> it's nothing for you oak to get in the car and drive a thousand miles. So people uh, might no. not know. I know that about you. You drive from. Right. Cleveland to New York from Alabama, from you drive from Georgia to New York. So yeah. th that's no driving is nothing to you. You're right. talking to, to you're talking to this young lady on the phone. You hear right. somebody in the background. You ask right. her who that is. She says Jeff. She never gives you the last name. She just said right. Jeff. And I guess there's some commotion going on. And you're like, what the right. hell is that going on? You hang up the phone, you get in your car and drive down. I drive all the way down to Charlotte. You know, and I asked her, where's this guy I was talking to? Because he had said something, like, who's that guy you talking to? And I'm like, tell him he's been this, really disrespected. So I drive down there, this and that. So then I find out, now the season started, right? Right. So he, he was playing with the Clippers. I'm in Toronto. Right. So um, he in Toronto. Toronto, now Toronto come to, um, I'm in Toronto. The Clippers come to Toronto. You know, they come in the day before, but they had the first shoot around or second shoot around. So the visit team most of the time get the first shoot around. Right. So I'm in the locker room. I I mean my thing. I went. He went on my mind, but I was more seen like I, I went to the, I went to practice too early or something because I, I I I ran out of things to do. So I was just bored. Right. And I realized that man that they had this shooting around. It's ten o'clock. 
So about five minutes to 10, I leave the locker room. Everybody else been watching tape. You know, I had came early, so I knew what we was going to do. So I walk out there, just walk in there, practice. I go straight, a big line straight towards him. Ask no question, no nothing. I just whack. Hold on, you just, hold on, oh, oh, oh. You just walk up what? on the man and just. And just walked in there, practice. They, they was practice. Yeah. In front, and you of, just, in front of the whole team, coaches, everybody. So I hit him. But my older was like, that's my best friend. I said, well, you get in line then, because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm hitting today. So I hit him in the head. He told me I had a ring on. Hit him in the head. <laughs> so about that time, my other teammates coming out, they seeing all of them around me, and they, everybody running down there, what's going on? So Avin Jenner, the coach, he called the NBA, Larry Richardson, and tell them that an Oak came in our practice and hit the player, right? So da da da. They call me back about three thirty. You know, we go back home. This and that. Three thirty. Oh, you suspended. Da da da. So April come around. You know, we go to L.A. He's sending out messages like, "Oh, we got all the crips and blood." When when you come to L.A., this and that. So I said, "Well, you know, the team coming. I'm coming." So I call my guy. We get in the night before. Two of us, two of them, and one of me. We go to dinner. I said, "Man, you know, this guy been talking mess." You know, so that. So he said, what's going on? I said, well, just bring five more guys. I'm going to have y'all seven tickets. All y'all wear black. And I'm going to get some tickets behind the Clippers bench. So uh, the guy came next day. Boom, boom. I got the tickets, gave them to him. They sit behind the Clippers bench with shades on. So the tr- one of the ball boys said, oh, wasn't them the guys I seen you leave it last? I said, yeah. I had, you know, that guy was there talking mess to me. So basically, I told these guys that, I might have a problem. Right. And they came and showed up. Guess what happened the first quarter? He played hurt. He seen seven guys sitting behind the bench. He knew something was up. He played hurt, went home. So after the game, my seven guys, we standing by the bus before we leave, this and that. They said, uh, what happened to the guy we're talking to? I said, man, he left, he left at halftime. So he, he ain't want no smoke. He <laughs> okay. didn't want that smoke. Okay. Lamar Odom, who said he was his best friend, you're at the All-Star game in D.C., correct? D.C., yeah. You're, you're at the hotel. So you're waiting for the elevator to, co- to, yep. to come to your floor. The door is open. It's Lamar Odom and three or four guys. Right. You get on the elevator. You say, somebody need to get off. They get off the elevator. All of them get off. Hold on. Oh, them get off. oh how you get on the <laughs> elevator and talk about somebody need to get off? They was on there first. Oh. <laughs> Oh, it didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you wild. Oh, man. It's just funny, man. It's, hey, this book, hey, hey, Shay, this book, the stories in the book, yes. I mean, it's just, it just easy to read, good story. I, mean, I tell everybody, don't be drinking no coffee or drinking no wine reading this book, because you're going to waste it. Yeah. Because <laughs> this book, boy, you don't know when, the, it's like somebody, you don't know where the punch coming from. You know, but it's just, I mean, I just want people to know, hey, this, hey, get, get them something to talk about. Have something on your shelf, like when you have your books, all your books shelf and this yeah. and that. So if I want something funny, what book I'm going to? I just want you to go to the enforcer. Uh, you got, look, I know Judge Mathis. I've met Judge Mathis oh. out here. How the hell you almost get the, sw- get the swing with Judge Mathis? Well, in that book, hey, Shay, it ain't in the book. I'm, I'm going to give you the beginning of it. Okay. So I'm in Cleveland. You know, about seven seven years straight, I used to have Labor Day weekend. We I had a club. We go to Musum Park, play softball, barbecue at my mother's house. So this this that summer, this summer we were having it. The weather was kind of bad. You know, I had a black van. Right. And, um. So everybody wasn't in town. They weren't coming into Saturday. So maybe about three or four people was in town. Most about 20 people come in town. But anyway, so we just go down to the Mirage. So we still went to the Mirage, about five of us in the van. So I walk in the Mirage, you know, my home, da da da. Everybody want to talk to you, this and that. I'm talking to this guy, and this other guy, oh, I need to talk to you. I said, man, I'm talking. Give me 10 or 15 minutes. He come up to me again. I said, I said, give me 10 or 15 minutes. About six, three or four minutes. I, he came up to me again. I said, no, what, man? You come up here again, I'm not, I'm going to smack the shit out of you. <laughs> then about 30 seconds, this man, he grabbed me. That what got me. I might have let him go, but he grabbed me. Man, I knocked him out, man. Hold up, you and, not uh, going to knock this out? 
No, no, no. I oh. ain't got to him yet. This, okay. This okay. all this is the same night though. So I'm in Cleveland. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this is Cleveland. So he grabbed me. Right. So I, I'm not, I turned around and knocked him out. So I ain't had nothing to drink or nothing. I'm just you know, talking to this guy. My people had a drink because we was there about 20, 30 minutes. So I'm talking. So by the time he grabbed me and I hit him, and then people come, oh, oh, what happened is that? I said, man, let's just get out of here. So we get out of there. I get in the van, we all, it's five of us. Start driving. My stepbrother and OJ is Eric Grant. He called me, we about five minutes from another spot. He said, oh, I heard just what happened. I like, well, yeah, man, he kept grabbing on me. He said, man, come on to Detroit. Detroit, most of the time, like 245 from Cleveland. I got there at like 215. <laughs> he said, we got a show, we go on, we go on last. And so but it's about 536, so we get there about 830, they on stage, he leave the back door, he leave the tickets. I got in the van, I got a strobe lights on, so I'm putting it like, I'm somebody important, right. you know, important, but like I'm in the show with the right. strobe lights. Right. So we go behind stage, stand up there, this and that. We see the last three songs, and uh, we see a lot, of, all the celebrities are here, so bam. So the show is over. Most time after the show, the, the members of the group is going to lock them with 30, 40 minutes of cool down. Right. So I hit him, right. I, and he said, well, I'm going over here. Jerry Coleman got a Sweet Georgia Brown. And he said, well, we'll be on about 45 minutes to an hour. So I get my crew, we get in the van, we go around there, da, 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 this and that. So we walk in, here go George Maffin, Queen Latifah, uh, uh, Kwame, Derek Coleman. I mean, it's just all kind of celebrities in there. So the girls on with, and the other two guys, so the girls said, we gotta go to the restroom, you know, freshen up. I said, go ahead, we'll wait till you come back. So they go in there for about four or five minutes, come back. And I said, they said, um, can we stay here with Queen Latifah? I said, I, I mean, just ask Queen. Queen said, yeah, she already had about four girls with her. Right. And uh, so we um, we um, go over there in the corner, Derek Coleman and Kwame, you know, they over there just kicking the breeze, this and that. So 30, 40 minutes go past, here come Eddie and Eric from OJ's. We can sit in there, Eric, you know, it's a good job, man, this and that. And they like, uh, man, I'm glad you came. Um, Eddie's like, oh. <laughs> Eric told me what you just did in Cleveland. I said, man, the man kept grabbing on me. You know how I do, Eddie, right. you from Cleveland. So uh, <laughs> Eddie said, yeah, we, we got to keep it up, man. We got to stay real with it. So about 20 minutes later, here comes Judge Mappis. Yeah, he go to check. He go, y'all check, check. I said, I'm like, we just been here 45 minutes. I mean, how many drinks did the girl have? I mean, no, oh, no, no, no. One thing led to another one. I said, what are you talking about? I said, DC, check this man. Oh, come on. I, oh, he coming over here bothering me. I ain't doing nothing. It wasn't a problem I paying the check. This is the way how he did it. Right. He thought like, he... you know, I'm take your ass for what I'm going to knock in your head. Eddie, like, oh, please. Oh, I said, Eddie, you know he wrong. He's going to bring, try to be disrespectful. You, you want to be trying to show out in front of Queen Latifah, you get the check. And one thing led to another. I said, Eddie, like, oh, please. I said, man. Then he said, I'm going to call my boys on you. I said, no, what? Call them. I threw my keys to my man Muto on here from Houston. I said, go out there, start the band. I had the stash bar in there. I said, when you hit the radio, hit the brakes, and then something goes I said, keep them ready. Cause if something come up here too out of the ordinary, you know what to do. So we got into it, man, just this and that. We found a get up by, I told the girl, see, that's what happened. Stay with the people you come with. Right. This would never happen. Cause if he couldn't have came over and had some, I'll pay a check. So, all the extra attention he came because of y'all. Oh, no, no, no. I said, okay, next time it go somewhere with me, stay in the truck or stay with me. Right. So we get in the road about two about two hours, almost back. Here come Butch Lewis calling me. Oh, I heard what happened, man. <laughs> I heard what happened. Yeah, he was wrong. If I ever see him again, I'm going to smack the dog out of him. <laughs> so, oh, please don't do this, man. So it, it was just a crazy night, man. He was trying to front. Trying to play the big shot role. You don't never tell somebody oh, you gonna call somebody on you. And I got a big band outside with all kind of equi equipment in it. Right. Not radio equipment either. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't had no DJ. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you this. I'm, I'm gonna get you out of here on this. Jordan had right. uh, obviously Charles Barkley. Jordan and Charles was very cool when they played. Right. Charles made some comments on his show on TNT. Yeah. He and Jordan have been cool since. Isaiah Scotty. Do you believe these guys will ever be cool again? No, no. It's just like asking, 
I don't think so. Isaiah, no. Isaiah mad because he took Chicago. Uh, he trying to say he told um, he didn't if he was gonna play on the dream team he wasn't gonna play. Um, Scotty, I mean Scotty just trying to put himself in a position that it's almost tough to even sit down sit across from a guy that went to war with you. Now you got you know sets up about him in the book. But uh, Barkley, ain't no more golf for Barkley. I told him it's time out. Barkley, you, you really messed up. TNT, hey, you gonna have to you have to work on TNT for the next twenty years because. Ain't no golf time for you, and uh, I feel sorry for you. Cause I know you really like to play golf, and right. your game's getting better. But you got to play with some other guys. And, and Jordan got and Jordan got the keys to all the top the, all the top courses over the world. Michael Jordan can, not, can not, take not, it. Hey, say not just that he got one of the best golf courses, Grove Twenty Three in the world. Yeah, and and he and, got uh, he, right. He built his own golf course. So Barkley probably, he probably get a plane that's right over because he ain't gonna ever play on it. He, <laughs> he, can, he can see it from the sky, but he can't see it from the ground. <laughs> you, oh, you in DC, you with the Wizards when Kwame mm -hmm. was there. What right. happened with Kwame Brown? Why wasn't Kwame able to fulfill the potential that so many people saw in him? Well, he had a lot of potential. Uh, I think that uh, Doug was there. And, um, you know, they drafted him, but they didn't work with him. And right. I think that's a lot that's going on in the league today. Kwame is real intelligent. Uh, he understands the game, but, you know, he has small hands. Um, you know, sometimes you you you, you put you, you can't get out of your own way. Some, right. I, sometimes I think that might have hurt the Kwame, Kwame because, like I said, he was intelligent. He, he got in his own way sometimes. And, and he probably thought they didn't put enough interest in him. They draft him with number one, but sometimes when you draft somebody with number one, you figure they can play. Right. So you got to you got to show you got to show me something and put interest in you. So they might didn't see that early. You know, they might ask him to do something. He probably didn't do it. They probably figured that, well, but he's lazy. But when I went back down there to coach him, the two years I was there, I mean, he, he want to work, but they didn't know him. They didn't get to really know him to see his weakness and you know what he do best. Right. So that might right. have been a management uh, problem because they didn't spend time with him enough to really to see what, how he functioned, what his thought of mind is. So some people are not real strong man. Some people right. need help. Right. That's why they said some people need to have pep talks. Right. You know, some folks you feel like they got to pep you up every game. He might have needed that, and they didn't give him that. Right. Do you do you think Jordan was hard on him because Jordan was trying to win championships? And a lot of guys, he, a lot of guys like LeBron. LeBron ain't trying to work with no rookie and get them ready to play. He want veterans, guys that understand how to play, so we can compete for a title. I ain't got trying to babysit you. Well, well I was the, I I didn't see Mike really. You know, he might have said, "Damn, Kwame catch the ball, shit, right. something like that." But he didn't ride Kwame like you know. I mean, he, he invested in you, so he he wanted you to do well. But he didn't want you to don't accept, you know. Right. He wanted to see the, what you had in you. Might, he might have been doing it to see what you tough minded enough. Right. But I don't think he was riding Kwame like that. They might have they might have talked about him in a way that was when they seen he wasn't feeling working out. But I thought I thought he had a lot of talent. But like I said. He might have put enough work in to get better. He might have just stayed at the same level, but seemed like later in his career, he got more hungry because I guess things when things ain't going right, you want to get you know you want to get better. Right. You know, it might have been too late to get better, and then people didn't have no trust in you. When people don't have trust in you, that ain't good. Do you remember? Do you remember Master P coming to Toronto? Yeah. Master P came up there, Butch called the game a trial. Master P was just funny. He was a guy, uh, he played in a couple of games, but you know, he was, hey, he probably just been glad to be on the team. Um, you know, uh, we 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 bonded. I mean, I, I mean, I get along with anybody until you they do? show me a side that I don't like, you know what I'm saying? But <laughs> I didn't have no problem with it, I man. You know, somebody from the music world getting a trial in the NBA. I mean, I was for him. He just didn't have enough talent. What about, let me ask you a question. The 80, 90 players, do you believe how many of the 80 and 90 players could play as well as they did in the 80s, 90s in today's game? And if we take today's players and put them back in the 80s, 90s? I think today's players have a harder time than the 80s and 90s players. Even though we played more half court in the 80s and 90s, but they were still skilled. Right. And the physicality was there. And I think these players couldn't have played half court like we did in the 80s and 90s. You know, not insult them, but... 
I think they just, they just not mindset ain't strong enough. And you watch them play, you don't see the the structure. The structure. Right. It, it was more structure in the 80s and 90s. Right. But I think it's kind of basketball. I look at it as like football. They've legislated the physicality out of football. Oh, yeah. out of, they've out legislated of the they've legislated the physicality out of basketball. They tried to make yep. it not a, an exclusively skill game. Right. You hard, you right. you got flagrant one, flagrant twos. Man, them were common fouls. And you might not even get a foul call with some of the fouls y'all did in the eighties and nineties. Right. Well, everything now is about money in, in the in, uh, in the global world. I think right. especially NBA. You know, they they searching for like when I play, it's probably like three percent UMP players. Now you got thirty or more, mm-hmm. and that's where the money's coming from. So. They're getting big contracts, and uh, NBA signed a contract what three or about four years ago, twenty four billion in nine years, and and I think that's probably when we played probably was two hundred million. So <laughs> you see how much they grow for global money. Do you think will will we ever see fights like you guys had in the eighties and nineties? Will they fight like that in today's NBA? I don't know where you see a fight like this. We we back in the eighties and nineties, you gonna have to Google it. <laughs> <laughs> go to Google again. <laughs> oh, look, the new thing now is celebrity fighting, the celebrity boxing matches. If I say, yes. oh, I say, okay, oh, I got, I got X amount of dollars for a celebrity boxing match. Who you want? Who you want your opponent to be? First one is Shaq, <laughs> Barkley, <laughs> uh, them two. Oh, you want Shaq? You want you want a, you want a celebrity boxing match with Shaq? Yeah, I'll tell you, I know you're about 75 pounds heavy, but I'll take him. You take Shaq in the boxing match? Because I know you yeah. used to you used to box now. Yeah, I got my, I got some pretty good hands. Oh, I, I still oh, hit the bag every now and then. Oh, do you? Yeah, but but I'm gonna be moving though, so but no, nah, it, it, it'll be fun. I would I would definitely do that though with an NBA X player. You, you know, would? So yeah. You know, I still got I still got the little look, <laughs> I got a little bob and weed in me. Right. Obviously. <laughs> Obviously, you know, you and LeBron, LeBron's a close friend of yours. You know LeBron. Grew up in Cleveland. He grew up in Akron. What's it like to have a, a, a guy like LeBron growing up and you see what he became? Did you think LeBron yeah. would be as good as he became? Well, you know, like I said, watching him from an early age until he, I think when he came to Chicago and saw the pros play that summer and he went back to college, I mean, went back to the high school and, and he's seen so much and like you say, like visualizing, like, you know, he's, he's one of them guys vision stuff. He felt like, wow, I got to get my gang like this, gang like that. Because he they didn't let him play. Right. He wanted to play. That was a challenge for him. But what he had done over his career, just it's just, it's just just incredible. On and off the floor. He's just been incredible. He stands for everything. He he holds guys accountable. And, off, and he got his crew with him. Right. Randy Rich and uh, Mab. Family, he's he just do it all. I never seen a guy do all this. Probably the first guy who's still playing to be a billionaire, still playing as a professional. It's just, hey, what more can you say? And like, I'm I'm just feel bad for him. The situation that's going on in L.A. right now, right. And last time I seen a situation like this with a superstar was with MJ first four, first five six years in the league when I when coming with the Bulls, getting thirty eight and eight and still losing five hundred team. That ain't him. He 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 deserved better than that, you know. And I think that uh, I don't know what is gonna happen. He might have to get out of L.A. I hate the fans, you know. Hear hear me say that, but he need he need he need a ring. He need a ring, and I think that he might have to lead to get it. And the two places that he can probably get it in right now is either Phoenix or Philadelphia. I said Philly. Him and Joel Embiid. Yes, make that trade, Bill Simmons. <laughs> LeBron, the money match. I think Portland was trying to do something to make the money match. I mean, um, Phoenix would make the money match because that's what they need. I, I like Phoenix this year for some reason. They right. really got another big man. I like them. They've been consistent the last two years because most team, most of the time, when you get to the finals and you don't bounce back the next year, you ain't gonna never get back. And they playing the same way they played last year, but they playing smarter and right. better. Right. <clears throat> oh, you used to be a gambler. I don't know if you still gamble like you used to. You like you was big in the cash game. Yeah. What, what's the most money you ever lost in a ga- cash game? Uh, I don't know. I'd say about 50. 
Fifteen. Your game is tunk. You still like you? Your game is tunk. No, we play tunk. We play poker. Uh, don't play no guts. I hate guts. You don't play boo ray. I hate guts. I don't. Nah, I like guts, but I hate boo ray. Okay. <laughs> so we had MJ birthday party. So I, I had did all the cooking, did all this and that. So we had a we had a poker game going on with MJ and some of the crew. We had another guts game going with Jay Z, World West, and a few other guys. So I was back and forth because I was doing, you know, I was doing the serving of the food and yeah, all that. Yeah, you cooking and everything, okay. So I got in late this day in the gut game. So da, 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 it lasted a few while. I was getting late, about 11, 30 to 12. So it was coming to an end. So JG boy won. I think he tried to, I think he called butt on him, but I was, I was swear to God, I was about to get in his ass because <laughs> I think he called the pot and didn't have the money. Even though he was with Jay, but still though, he didn't have it in front of him. So we don't play that. You borrow, you call something, then you borrow. No, you got to have it in front of you to call it. Right. So uh, I was kind of heated, but uh, it was a good night because that was my man birthday. You know, second night. And, yeah, you can't you know, set it off at the man birthday. Oh, damn! I was about to. I know like you. Chris Cross, <laughs> I'm about to. <laughs> I know you about to. You can't set it off in your. <laughs> Let me ask you this: What are your thoughts on Ben Simmons? How that situation is playing out in Philadelphia. Doc said what he said. I'm not sure we can win a championship with him. Joel and B said the game changed when we had a, a layup. I mean, we had a layup right. and we end up getting a, a free throw. What are your thoughts on Ben Simmons? Is he handling it right? What should he do and how should he handle it? Ain't nobody handling it right. But Ben Simmons got to take a lot of the blame, at least 60%, because they gave you $170, $80 million right. to play basketball. And you tell them you don't want to shoot, you don't want to do this and that. My thing is, you sign a contract, you got to play. Right. Then management right. come in, da da da, this and that. We want, we want one twenty on a dollar, and now he ain't worth maybe sixty percent on a dollar. So my thing is, everybody dropped the ball. Doc is the coach. I know he might not say, you know, what he said about a player, but they tell players to make sure if you're gonna say something, say something good. Right. Same thing should go to coaches. Um, it's just a tricky situation. I think that he definitely gonna have to be traded because the Philly fans gonna kill him. They might if he walk back on that floor, he, can't. he might well start digging the grave the same night because they gonna kill him. Yeah, he the can't fans go, ain't gonna go for that. Nope, he can't go back to Philly. Uh, he can't go back to Philly. So I, they better go. They can get maybe sixty percent on the dollar. They need to go and find a trade in the next seven eight days. If not, they gonna go down to thirty. They, next thing you know, they. Hey, you might as well let him walk because ain't right. nobody going to give you too much for him. I right. think L.A. Mike will take him right now because L.A. sooner or later going to have to rebuild because they yeah. what they're having right now is, is they got issues. they right. losing too many games and to too many bad teams. And they got – they got you got three or four Hall of Famers, but it ain't it ain't showing everybody on the court. Right. It's not meshing. Oh, oh, we know you're a great cook. You once cooked for Oprah. But – I mean, being from the South, you probably had some some possum, a raccoon, some squirrel, some rabbit. <laughs> what What's the wildest thing you've cooked? Well, the wild thing I cooked was alligator. I was on chop. Okay, I had alligator. Well, alligator just like chicken, so you you can you can season the same way with some flour, a little egg, and you know dip it in there and fry it. But uh, you know, alligator. I mean, it was good. I I was surprised, but it's just like chicken, but it's got a little. It's a little gamier. It's a little get. Yeah, it's a little tough. A little gamier. Yeah. Yeah, you know, gaming. More so, like, uh, yeah, like, like duck. So, I know this about you. You love cooking. I mean, you go over to people's house and you try to take over the kitchen. And you just like, hold on, you, you, you just got. <laughs> how you gonna take? How you gonna take over my kitchen? Where, right. did you, where did the love of cooking came from? Love from? from the cooking came like just being picky. Uh, going, going to restaurants. Don't like the food. And be picky, you, you got to know the food. So right. my thing is, I just try to learn. Like when I was my, in Chicago, we used to play like Tonka Spade. I make fried wings, spaghetti. I start there. Next time I'm making some else, I'm making some uh, some baked some baked chicken and some broccoli rice. So I just build up from there, and just next thing you know, I just got everything down. And um, and to this day, um, I'm pretty good in the kitchen. Oh, you thinking about opening up a restaurant, or you just want to cook on the side? Cook on. The, I, I was part of the two different restaurants, but I think if I open a restaurant up, I'm gonna have to be there every day because people are gonna come in just to critique my food, and if it ain't good, they are gonna try to send it back. So I already know what they're gonna do. Right. So I'm gonna stay away from that and just keep doing my little small things, 
my charity work, and um, and just keep living. Oh, you know, you remember uh, I called you at the, uh, it was 2016, I think, when the uh, Cavaliers came back from 3-1. I said, right. Oak, I said, Oak, if they, if they come back, I'm going to come to the parade. So sure yeah. enough, they come back, you call me. You yeah. coming to the parade? I say, I say, oh, you for real? He like, hey, I already got the ticket. We go go back. We go go behind the scene. Hey, hop on the flight. Hey, we, <laughs> hey I came and pick you up at the airport. We rolled down there. Yep. We standing right there. They come LeBron in the Rose convertible and all the cast. Like, come on up. We went and took the picture. We had a ball. It was we, cool though. Man, it was great. The fans. It, it was great. Yep. Cause I remember being on Skip's uh, the, uh, first take and telling Skip, mm -hmm. I'm going to the parade. Now, they hadn't even started yet. I said, I'm going to the right. parade. I'm going to be on the fire truck, yada, yada, yada. And lo and behold, yeah, the thing came to, came to fruition. Man, yeah. I, had, I, had, I had a great time. I had a great time. Yeah. But, oh, man, congratulations on the book. The, Thanks, last, the last enforcer. Like I said, some yeah. of the stories I knew because having known you for almost 30 years, right. I knew some of the stories. But some of the stories, y'all right. got to go get this book. You gonna you gonna you gonna laugh because you gonna like this man is out of his mind. He's yeah. not out of his mind. He's very sane, <laughs> but he's a no nonsense, no BS type of guy. The last enforcer, outrageous stories from the life and times of one of the NBA's fiercest competitors, Charles Oakley. Oak Tree, man, I appreciate the time today, bro. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you, man. I'm gonna be out there next week, so uh, I'm doing something for a skit roll for the Super Bowl. So uh, I'll give you a hit when I get out there. No problem, bro. Good to see you. Thanks again. Love all you, man. I right, love you too, bro. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice, got to roll the dice. That's why, all my life, I've been grinding all my life. Look, all my life, been grinding all my life.